Hello and welcome to today's webinar, a methodical approach to automating incident response for the cloud. This event is brought to you in partnership with Alert Logic. Thanks so much for joining us on the webinar. We've got a really cool topic lined up for you today and a live demo. So uh, you're in for a treat on this event. As always, we want this to be an educational event here at Actual Tech Media. We encourage your questions there in the questions pane. I see that many of you have already found that and said, you know, hello or good afternoon, uh, wherever you are around the, uh, around the world. And we appreciate that. Uh, but we also want your technical questions on today's topic. So as you're watching the presentation and the demo, if you have a question on your mind, we appreciate that and uh, look forward to using those there in the live Q&A session that's coming up at the end of the event. We also have our best question prize to help encourage those. I'll talk about that here in just a moment. Uh, but first, I want to call your attention there to the handouts tab. It's there that you'll find a link to the practical requirements for responding to cyber threats with MDR. So make sure that you check out that PDF resource. Uh, you can download that and read it after the event. There's a lot of uh, ad additional details in there, some great information. So make sure that you check that out. At the end of the webinar, I'll be announcing the winner of our Amazon $300 gift card door prize. If you're watching on demand, of course, that drawing would have already occurred. Uh, the prize terms can be found there in the handouts tab as well. And like I mentioned, we have our best question prize for an additional Amazon $50 gift card. Uh, we'll be contacting the prize winner of that after the event, but you have to ask a question, of course, to be entered into that. Uh, so just a, another example of how we appreciate your questions. And with that, it's now time to kick off today's webinar with our two expert presenters. I'm excited now to bring in Mr. Antonio Sanchez uh, with uh, Alert Logic, who's in product marketing, and Matt Saylor, who is a technical product manager, uh, also at Alert Logic. Uh, Antonio and Matt, it's great to have you on. I'll first hand it off to you, Antonio. Take it away. All right. Terrific. Thank you, David. Thank you for having us on today. Hello. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. We are, we're thrilled to be here to talk to you guys a little bit more about this topic, um, incident response. It's something that's both very near to myself as well as my colleague, Matt Saylor's heart. A uh, little bit about me. Um, I've been at Alert Logic here about two years. I've been in the security industry for over 10 years and I've just kind of been in IT in general for my entire career. Um, Matt, do you care to uh, introduce yourself quickly to the audience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, like Antonio, I've been at Alert Logic for a while. Um, my background is in systems engineering, really automation. And it's great to bring that perspective into uh, the product side these days. And, and uh, our response product is really my baby right now. It's so exciting to be able to talk to you about it. All right, terrific. Thank you, Matt. So, you know, like David said, if there's any technical questions, by all means, go ahead and send those over. Uh, we do have the people on the line. And when I say the people, I'm referring to Matt because I'm just a marketing guy. Um, <laughs> Uh, but if we don't answer your question live on air, we'll be sure to follow up with you um, as well to get any questions answered. Um, this is what our agenda is going to look like for today. We're going to talk a little bit about why automating response is a necessary um, it's a necessary option. It's quickly not becoming an option, becoming a requirement. And we'll go over a little bit about the industry trends that are driving us pretty much in that direction where it's making it a requirement rather than an option. We'll talk a little bit more about um, phasing in a strategic approach with respect to response maturity and the journey to response maturity. We'll get into a few use cases where we'll talk about how some of this can be practically implemented. And then we'll, and then Matt's going to, and Matt and I will be kind of going back and forth as we're discussing these items. And we're also going to end up showing you a demo within the actual product as well. Hopefully the, the demo guides will be on our side today because when we're doing these events, it's one of those things that you kind of never know, right? So first, wh whenever I talk to a customer, Matt, anybody else, we basically talking about the importance of both pre, of both pre and post breach and why that's critical for an organization, right? And and whether you're new to the security industry or fairly new security industry, and maybe you're just developing your security strategy or developing your security policy for the first time, or maybe you've been around for a little while and you need help in kind of justifying kind of your security strategy and how it evolves, hopefully this will be something that'll be able to, to, to resonate with you. But the reason we constantly talk about 
both pre and post breach is because with pre breach, you think about these should be kind of the housekeeping items that every organization should be doing. The first thing that comes to mind, at least for me, is patching and having a good patching program. That in itself is one of the best ways to be able to to ensure that you're reducing your overall risk, um, addressing the vulnerabilities that exist. And there's lots of them, right? And you can't get to all of them because they're always going to be there. But there are things that you can be able to do to be able to uh, address those and to be able to close that gap. And then other things when it just comes just to plain misconfiguration issues and being able to ensure that you don't have a Things like uh, over privileges, over provision privileges for things for people that don't necessarily um, need to need to have access to everything. Right. So these are all important things that every organization should be doing, regardless of size or industry, things that are going to help reduce the possibility of an attack. Right. And the reality is is that even when you do all those things, it still doesn't mean that there isn't going to be something or someone that's going to get through because gone are the days or anything that says anything is going to be 100%. Several years ago, before the advent of the cloud, you could make the argument, say, well, just disconnect the servers from the plug and then you're 100% safe because nobody can get in. You can't even say that anymore because once information and data is in the cloud, it's going to always be there as well. So you have to be able to have a plan on what you're going to do. And the just because, uh, sorry, you have to have a plan and a response action of what you're going to do in the event your organization or your virtual perimeter gets breached, right? And just because it gets breached doesn't mean that all of your data is all of a sudden exposed to the world, right? The moment you get breached, there's still a time in the middle before something actually happens. And if you can catch it right there, that's still a good thing because you've mitigated and you've contained any potential damage. So, and but the only way to do that is to have a plan in place or a strategy in place to be able to address it once it does happen. And this is something that we talk about to customers on a daily basis, ensuring that you have both the left side, the pre-breach and the post-breach that you're thinking about with respect to your security strategy, and then apply that to whatever tool set you have in-house. Which kind of leads us to the problem that sort of exists today, right? And that is security teams are lean. And this is a study, this is a, these information and these numbers are in the report that David talked about in the PDF, which we've provided for you. It's a research that's done by 451. But they talk about how regardless of the size of the organization, every single company, every single company is going to have limited budget or they're going to need to do more with their existing budget. And essentially what that means is that they just don't have the headcount or the staff. I was at a in-person event recently, um, socially distanced, of course, and one, there were multiple people in the audience that said that they had multiple requisitions out for security analysts that they can't even get resumes to. There's just not enough people out there. And anybody who's been in the security industry for around, around for a while, rather, they understand that, that there's too many roles out there and you just can't find them. Enterprises or the organizations with really big, really deep pockets or maybe highly uh, regulated, they have to be able to address this with headcount or that's usually what, the way they do this. But when you get to smaller enterprises, mid-sized companies, smaller organizations, it, it's, it's always going to be the same where organizations are going to be extremely, extremely lean. Um, Matt, do, do you what are you hearing or what are you talking to with customers and analysts when you're talking about kind of the, the role of security and headcount and staffing in general with your interactions? Sure. So I spend a lot of my time talking to customers who are on their automation journey. They're coming to us and looking for help to address address the kinds of problems that Antonio was just talking about. And it's very common for the people I speak to to have one, two, or three folks. Um, you know, and those people are often spread really thin. Um, you might just have, you know, a kind of more manager person, a manager focused person who's got some technical skills, a couple of folks, and, and they of course have to spread their work across 
uh, you know, compliance activities, reporting, you know, sometimes they might share some of the regular IT tasks. And all of those people are looking for ways that they can, you know, standardize, that they can leverage the, the staff that they have, uh, and then bring on new people as quickly as possible to get into the solution. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it kind of, and it's not just bringing on new people and you kind of touched on this a little bit, but you're bringing on people, but you want to be bringing on people that hopefully have some sort of expertise with whatever it is you're bringing them on for. Hopefully it's the cloud, whether it's the cloud or maybe security expertise. But even then, I mean, when you think about skills and expertise and the shortage of some of these stuff, not all of it is technical. Some of it is just business expertise. I was talking to a, a, a gentleman at a company the other day that was saying that one of the people, one of his uh, direct reports, fairly new to the to the workforce. He's a fairly recent college grad, and the first one of the first things he asks when talking about their uh, how they respond and how how do they respond to incidents is, is who do I go for in the event something gets through? Like how do I know who to call? You don't have to have technical expertise to be able to say you know what we should probably have documented somewhere information about the stakeholders, the necessary stakeholders in the event something something happens, right? So it's a mix of both business as well as technical expertise that organizations need and they're looking for. And, and, it's, and it's a tough thing for them to try and be able to, to solve for, right? Um, many of them are finding that they just need help doing this. And this is kind of, you know, shameless plug for, for us here. This is kind of what we do. We're a managed service, alert logic. We're managed detection and response provider. Um, and, and this is what we do. We bring, we provide a service to those organizations that don't have the ability, they either don't have the budget or they don't have the ability to go find the people that they need in order to be able to, to staff their organization and watch their environment and ensure that they have 24 seven uh, visibility and detection and basically across their entire IT estate. Right. And we've got some links in there. If you're new and you've never heard of Alert Logic before, we'll kind of, uh, there, there's some information towards the end, which will give you a little bit more information to learn a little bit more about us. But this is what we do. We help with this problem, which, uh, which by all accounts of all the, the industry experts that you see out there, it's only going to get, uh, it's only going to get worse. So this is one of the things that we, uh, that we do. So shifting gears a little bit, you know, that's kind of what we're solving for. You know, how do you approach response, right? What, what do you do? And this is just gonna, this is a build side, I'm gonna build it out real quick, but you know, you have everything from manual, you kind of do everything at once, you look at an incident and then somebody has to make some sort of determination and some sort of evaluation before those move on. Well, that's all fine and dandy if you have 10 of them come in. I don't know a single organization I've ever talked to that only has 10, things coming in with all the telemetry data that's available nowadays. You know, usually this number is in the hundreds. For some, it's even in the thousands as well. You know, and then for some, and then you have other people that are like, oh, well, we're going to go ahead and fully automate everything. Well, that's nice to say, but in practical terms, that's not realistic. The, the, the sweet spot seems to be somewhere in the middle. And we'll kind of go into this a little bit more detail, talking about kind of each of these phases and kind of what they mean. But with the first one, you know, Matt, Talk a little bit about manual response, because pretty much everybody is starting here at some point, right? Right. I mean, you know, typically when uh, when I'm going into an organization, you know, the, the story that you almost always hear is we've got some run books, we've got some policies that we've created and, and we've decided, you know, this is what needs to happen. Um, you know, when a phishing uh, email comes in, the the people, um, the frontline staff get a ticket about it, then they go into the software and disable this and make sure that this sender is not going to make it through in the future. When we see an external attacker from the internet, we go and log into our three firewalls, uh, edit the access control lists, you know, make sure they're saved, maybe test them afterwards, uh, and then log all of this maybe in an incident response system so that you can uh, have a, a kind of compliance attestment that you have at the end of these. So a lot of the people who are entering into these conversations have started the process of systematizing these, right? But they're, they're not 
necessarily going to make um, fast progress. A lot of their staff is going to be spending time doing the same thing over and over again. And of course, that's not efficient. Um, but it also can lead to you know, inconsistencies. Are you going to do the right job in the middle of the night versus you know, at uh, 3 o'clock on a Wednesday? Um, are you, is the person who is really new to your organization going to know how to achieve each of those steps at the same speed as someone who set it up to begin with? And so even if you have these manual responses, it's very common to recognize that this is a time sink and a um, an opportunity for mistakes to be made or just, just differences in, in how policy uh, is applied. So lots of people come in with you know this as a, a starting point. And you know, sometimes they'll ask us for help about these as well. But a lot of people know what it is that they need to do to be able to um, you know, start their response strategy. What they need to do is find a way to reduce those um, you know, really manual efforts and to standardize those so that they can spread that load across, make it repeatable, uh, and so forth. Really, um, what we're looking at when we see people taking that next step um, in the maturity is to start bringing in um, what we call human guided response here. And this is really running those playbooks, running those policies with the help of some automation. Um, um, these might be applying a block to you know, multiple firewalls after you get an approval. Uh, and really during the process of, of doing these, one of the things that organizations learn is which of the actions that they're taking they can sort of trust and depend on and, and have good security outcomes. Um, and that, that's about people's trust in the data coming in, and it's people's trust in what's happening in response. Okay, when I block something on these firewalls, I know that it's going to work out all right. When I isolate this host of my network, I know what to expect when that happens. Having a human in that loop um, gives you the, the point of view to take a look at that and then start to understand and grow your response strategy. Uh, and you're going to save time, even in the middle of these, by uh, having a tool that helps you automate some of those steps after you've made that critical and informed decision. You know, a lot of the ways that these start, you're know, just kind of at a super high schematic level, um, you know, would be we've detected, you know, using whatever system you have, some sort of external attack. It's coming from the internet. It's coming from uh, an IP that's out there somewhere, not inside of your network. And, you know, very simple kind of a trigger that would begin this workflow. It's really a great place to start just to send this to your security staff and say, should we, should we deal with this in an automated fashion? Or does it require further investigation? that we would need to go through. So there's a simple fork in the road. Um, and once you've uh, taken one fork or the other, you can move on to the next thing and know that you're sort of done with this. But the key point in a lot of these um, uh, sort of human guided versions is that there's a person making that initial decision to take an action. And I think that's really the core of getting some, um, something, some experience under your belt for uh, response and response automation. And Matt, if I could just jump in, staying on that slide Absolutely. here. I mean, essentially what the organization is doing is they're training what their model looks like, right? Because you don't turn, you don't go from fully manual to fully automated. You kind of have to understand what are the potential outcomes of doing an automated action? And is one of those outcomes going to be something negative, right? Because it, you're, you're, you're trying to remove some of the, the binary uh, decision-making process because while it might say, hey, well, if it's this, I'm going to block it. If it's this, I'm going to investigate. Well, once you start adding additional conditions like, well, who's the person this is affecting? Is it a contractor that's doing work for us or is this a CEO? Because that could very well be another condition of saying, oh, if it's the CEO, we want to obviously take a, a different, more more quickly decisive action than if it was going to be a contractor. So essentially what you're doing is at this point, for the most part, you're either learning or you're training your model. Would that be fair to say? 
Yeah, absolutely. And some of those things will probably always remain human. Um, it might depend on how frequently they occur or the, you know, the value or the, the consequence of those actions. Um, but some of those things you'll learn you know, as you go through are really you know, every single time we're going to, we're going to do this. And, and those are going to be our, our targets for some of the, the higher automation. Just you know, really briefly, one thing that, that we see very commonly when people are automating these playbooks is that they really are like um, a flowchart almost. You, know, you can think of them not as novels, but as paragraphs um, that involve you know, a few decision points, sometimes a human, sometimes you might be able to understand what the, the conditions are based on maybe what part of your network an attack is occurring in, or like Antonio said, the, the, the user who's targeted and, and your knowledge of them or looking them up in something like that. Um, we think it's important to have many ways to have approval. You know, For our uh, own system, we have everything from email to an app to sending out to you know, chat services and things like that. And then you know, once you have those approvals, you can then begin to do the rest of the automated actions that you'd have, you know, whether that's a blocking action, um, doing some user disablement, isolating a host, or choosing not to take any action at all, uh, and then to, to follow up on that. And what you'll find as you, as you move these out is you'll end up with a few playbooks, a few recipes, a few um, uh, ways that you can that you can approach your response strategy that makes sense for you and your organization. And Tony, you wanna to talk a little bit about the, how that journey progresses farther? Yeah, absolutely. So again, you're, 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 you're training and you're learning both internally and you're learning your systems and your environment. And eventually you're gonna to get to a point that's, I mean, we call it fully automated response, although I would say that that's more of a utopia. I don't know that anything is ever going to be fully automated because then that's how Skynet happens, right? Um, but more than anything, the maturity curve, if you kind of notice what this says, and this is outlined in the actual report that, that you guys have available or the audience has available, is that when you're, when you ha when you're at this phase of the maturity model, you basically have a, a mix of certain things that you can fully automate Think about the, the the noise, the the signal to noise ratio that you have that you can be able to just filter out the noise of your organization or the incidents that are just really nothing more but noise. You have a way that you can be able to um, manually have a touch point of some sort before you make that next decision. So we talked about you know evaluating what should I do next, and that what should I do next could very well be something whether you assign it to somebody or a blocking action or a hey, wake somebody up, it's midnight on a Sunday, right? Um, and then there's just other things where it's going to be, it's always going to be sort of a, a manual process or a predominantly manual process. And when we talk about predominantly manual stuff, usually that's anything that's high likelihood for business interruption. So the, the thing I hear most often in talking to customers when, when we talk about automation in general is, look, if it's my e-commerce server, that's got to be 24-7, 365 don't touch anything, let me know, and I'll handle it, but don't touch anything. And when you get to this point, then you're able to achieve some consistency because you have a healthy mix of things that you're actually able to, to, to help filter out and help address, uh, help, help address some, of the, uh, some of the issues, which is just all of the alerts and all of the incidents and all of the fatigue that comes along with that as well, right? Um, and it kind of gets us into, oops, I, skipped ahead of me a little bit um the, what what essentially we're, we're striving for when it comes to increasing your your response maturity right and at the end of the day it's all about um, making everybody and everything all the tools all the resources freeing them up and making them more efficient right you want to be able to confidently reduce the false positives you want to be able to have your staff regardless of, of what that resource is be able to focus on the high prior highest priority incidents that have the highest impact of the organization right that's the goal that's the thing that everybody is is trying to get to right um and that's that's essentially once you have a way to be able to figure out where in the process that you can automate what things you can automate with high confidence that aren't going to be false positives or false negatives for that matter you can be able to focus on those things that are going to be able to uh, improve the overall security posture of your organization right um 
and and we kind of have a handful of, of of run books or playbooks that we've put together now correct me if i'm wrong but some of these are kind of templates that we've put together is that right yeah that's right one one of the ways that we try to help um, our customers uh, address response is by creating some um, canned best practice recipes for them. And these are these uh, that we've kind of represented very schematically here. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit of it in a second are just some common patterns that come out um, that people find, you know, very high value um, types of things. And the thing that I want to emphasize as I work through a couple of these and then and then roll into the demo for a second is that you can get a lot done um, just by sort of plugging a few actions together, having integrations with devices that you have, adding a little bit of logic and adding the right kind of human automation to those. So, you know, we uh, we think that the right metaphor for this is not, you know, writing Python or or whatever kind of scripting language you want. It, it's something that's that is more uh, you know visual. It is, is more interactive. You can usually explain to people like this. So, if you take you know some of my example that I showed earlier, and you start to specialize that, you might come up with a more specific trigger than just external attacks. But maybe you know from experience that these attacks that are detected by your security system as anomalous attacks. Uh, are of particular uh, importance to you. And when you see an anomalous attack that comes from something that uh, isn't known to you already, you know, maybe it's not one of your external uh, PCI scanners, maybe it's not one of your data centers, then it's worth it just to block that without anyone touching this, right? So this is a way to, to, to take some of the chaff away, to get rid of the, the low value investigations you might have to do. Uh, and then focus on um, the ones that you would have farther uh, uh, by you know, either blocking them in this case or having some other workflows um, that happen. But if you know what's going on and you know that it is a scanner, there's no need to investigate that further. You can just close those out and, and concentrate your resources on another part of your incident workflow. Same kind of um, really common types of workflows that we have would be like a time of day um, uh, switch on for customers. So um, there's going to be non-critical attacks, incidents, security findings that come in throughout the course of the, the workday and afterwards. Uh, during the day, you might want to send those to your uh, Slack server, have a dedicated channel for those. Uh, someone can keep an eye on it, see if something pops out. Um, when they're not around on the weekends, maybe you can have a low priority page that goes out instead. So you're just going to make a simple determination based on time of day and send those out um, so that someone, if they happen to be looking at their phone, um, they, they can take a look. If not, it's not going to wake them up in the middle of the night. These are the kind of decisions that can really increase the, the quality of life for, for your security staff. Uh, and they can help you um, uh, focus on the things that you have. So when you are looking at uh, a critical incident, you're not being distracted by the other ones. And of course, as you go through and build these, what you'll discover is that you will gain more confidence with automation as you work with these, as you take some of these templates and you configure them, as you take some of the patterns, as you look at people's best practices and see what works. And you'll find yourself building, you know, moderately complicated workflows, you know, and, and start to build in both, you know, blocking, high priority paging, maybe based on, like Antonio was saying, what are your high value targets? Is your application server? Okay, great. I know when that's under attack, I need to get to my security team. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to put it down that path. So you'll see the evolution of these playbooks um, happen, uh, you know, pretty frequently inside of, um, inside of a lot of customers working with these. So let me just go and show um, really briefly, a little bit of the alert logic platform and how we've approached this problem. Um, and then we're going to uh, wrap up by kind of taking a step back and, and answering some of your questions. So if you bear with me just a second and get the screen sharing going here. So and Antonio mentioned um, a little bit about our managed detection and response um, platform. Um, but one of the one of the primary ways that that people consume this is through a web console at Alert Logic, and you know, there are all sorts of uh, functions in here, everything from the you know vulnerability scanning response and uh, automated response is a new capability that uh, that we've been working on bringing to the platform recently. Um, inside of automated response, you can certainly build out these graphical workflows, and 
you know, this is an example of a workflow that um, is probably someone in that middle box that I was talking about earlier, that kind of um, human customized automation. So one of the main decision points in this workflow is really um, a decision about whether when this, uh, when this playbook is triggered, you know, what are we going to do with it? We're going to send an approval request to one of our security team to ask them what they want to do with it. And we can make sure that we include the right kind of information in that. You know, we'll have some auto completion for, you know, who's the attacker, where did it happen inside of my network and so forth. We'll help you fill those kind of things out, template and so forth. But really the key to this is that this is a, this is a uh, sort of a middle of the road, human guided interaction as built out. It might get triggered for a set of incidents that you have. You know, in this case, maybe the critical incidents, ones that our security operations center has determined um, are uh, critical and, and escalated incidents to you. Maybe ones that are against a certain set of your resources that you've identified as high risk or part of your PCI environment. Uh, and then you would go and you know trigger these uh, based on uh, that that workflow. And when one of the events that comes in that that uh, matches these conditions fires, of course, then you would get a message, or in our case, something on a, a mobile app or something in your in your chat server, that would then go and ask you, "Hey, um, do you want to approve this?" And then go and execute the rest of this strategy. And again, this is a really common kind of playbook based on uh, a number of playbooks that I've helped customers build, where when the approval happens the user is gonna take several actions in this case in different technologies. And these are gonna be sort of done repeatedly, right? So I don't need to log into AWS to handle my production blocks for those. We're gonna take care of that. If you deployed one of our WAFs, our web application firewalls in one of your data centers, we'll take care of the blocks for those to reach out to your firewalls and block those. And when you take this all together, this becomes an edge blocking strategy. You know, of course, not all responses would necessarily be at the edge, but this could be one of the one of the workflows yeah. that you would um, take care of. Uh, and of course, you know, because we're looking at an incident management workflow, you can say, by the time you get to the bottom of this, hey, this incident that I've had um, over here has been marked complete. It's done. I don't have to worry about it anymore. Or if it wasn't approved, we weren't able to do the automated blocking for that. We'll mark that um, as not approved and someone can then follow up and take a look at this um, later on. One of the key benefits to using this in a really graphical workflow, and, and this, is, this is not uncommon uh, in these kind of tools, is that you can then go and modify these to remove those approvals, right? So this is not, again, a big programming exercise. If as a user, you decide that you're happy with the trigger that you've set up for this, that the, the conditions that you have are good, that when you've run this previously, it worked every time, then really what you're gonna do is just go in here and say, hey, you know, I really no longer want to worry about the steps where I was going to deal with not approving these. And this is just going to become, you know, a fully automated workflow. Um, I can still invoke this manually if I need to on a case-by-case -case basis, but this is what it means for me when I have an edge blocking strategy. And if you inquire, if you acquire some new devices, we'll just add those to the chain of things that are used to block at the edge. So you know, you change your firewall vendor, or you move into a different cloud provider, uh, or you use a different technology in one of those cloud providers. You know what you'll often see is just lots of different actions that you can apply, plug into these workflows, and then be able to take those um, take those steps. And of course, you could add logic in here about you know testing for attributes, internal, external, looking at the time of day, and so forth. Um, but really, the the big point about the method the the methodical approach is to be able to have these executable artifacts that you can look at that live alongside your security tool that you can understand and manipulate and grow, modify as you go along, and then really be able to take those and take the steps that you need to get the security outcomes. Um, you know, it's really common to hear that breaches have been going on for days or weeks before people are able to respond to them. And anything you can do to reduce that time to cut off attacks um, as they start to expand will reduce your profile to being attacked. 
have lots of strategies, uh, apply those where you can, and uh, you'll definitely be able to reduce the risk and achieve a higher level of safety um, for this. Antonio, is there anything else that you'd like me to call out here, or do you want to kind of go back and, and wrap up some of the, the rest of this? Yeah, I just want to go ahead and ensure that one of the takeaways that, that, that they're looking at here is just the ease in being able to create some of these playbooks or modify the playbooks and update them, right? I mean, we've tried to make it very easy for people to be able to integrate with them or be able to work with them. I mean, some of the people, some of the customers that we talk to are of the mindset of, hey, I don't want to deal with anything. You guys deal with it and let me know if it's something real critical. And others, like, I want to be able to be an active participant and actively um, engage in, in what you guys do and how you do it. So, you know, make it easy to be able uh, to, to be able to do that. Right. Um, and, and this all just kind of comes yeah, as part of the service. Go ahead. Yeah, this is this is absolutely something that's included with the platform um, for us because we think that being able to respond and being able to move along this journey is something that's really important um, to do to reduce those times. When you look at customers, you know, uh, even even fairly sophisticated customers, they will have playbooks with just one or two or three actions in them, um, and it's still worth it for them to save the five or ten or fifteen minutes of the day that it takes to not have to log into that cloud environment not have to worry about the credentials changing, to not have to worry about remembering which access control list on the firewall is the one that gets you there. Just by codifying these things, just by building them into the tool, and just by being able to connect that to the rest of your incident workflow, you're going to save so much time um, just by putting these things together, grabbing all that low-hanging fruit, automating as much as possible, and using the rest of those human-assisted or human-guided workflows to save you the rest of that time. I think I can stop sharing here, and then this will go back to you, Antonio. You want to take us out? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, you you've seen some of this stuff already. Well. Matt has focused on just kind of the 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 response section of the platform, but I mean, there's there, there's so much more that we're able to do. We're just kind of focused on this because it's something that we've been working on for a while. We've actually been uh, working on it for a few quarters now, setting up a lot of the building blocks to be able to get to this point, and we're really, really excited by it. But it's one of those things where if you've ever uh, heard the term, you know, the uh, the the art of the possible. I mean, that's kind of the direction, or that's the kind of, that is the direction that we're going is the art of the possible is what do you want to be able to, to do with this? And some of the practical things that we're doing to help you get started, to move you along uh, that response journey uh, and, and ensuring that what you have is going to be something that that is high confidence is going to be able to make everybody within the organization that much more, uh, that much more efficient, right? Um, and so I think we got a poll question coming up. Yes, we do have a poll question. So I don't know if I'm supposed to do something here or if that's going to be pushed for me. Oh, I think it just got pushed. Terrific. Absolutely. Yeah, I just brought up the poll on the screen for everyone out there that says, uh, what sort of task are you interested in automating? And this is a multi-select question here. So you can you know, feel free to select more than one. And if the task that you're interested in automating is not listed on there, you know, drop it in the questions pane. We want to hear your feedback and, you know, we can improve this poll and, and uh, we can address uh, that task here in our Q&A session, uh, which speaking of that, uh, it's time to start Q&A. So if you have some, some questions on your mind, now's the time to get them in. We've gotten a lot of great questions already. So uh, I'll just go ahead and I guess start with this one uh, from Jason who asked uh, what might be a recommended ratio for InfoSec personnel to total employee he headcount for SMEs? Uh, Antonio or Matt, you wanna chime in on that? Uh, I'll start with that one. So it, I, I hate to say this answer because it's the it's it, it's going to seem like the cop out answer, but at the end of the day, it depends, right? It depends on the complexity of your IT estate. It depends on your industry. It depends on how regulated you are. We've talked to customers where just very recently we had a we had a summit and a couple of the customers that we had uh, that we were highlighting on our summit, one of them said that security is a shared responsibility across four different people. 
which is a little scary because if it's a shared responsibility, that means nobody owns it. So, and this was basically people whose full-time job is more keep the lights on, continue to innovate, continue to deliver their uh, they were delivering new applications. They were an e-commerce platform for uh, for B to B to C, and we've seen other people where they've got uh, they've got staff of multiple people all the way up to some of the enterprises who say, look, you know, we have a large enterprise. We can throw money at this, but at the end of the day, we figure it would make more sense to just uh, have you guys watch over this for us and just let us know what's happening because I've got my my team chasing down other things right now. Um, Matt, do you have any any thoughts yeah, on that yeah, one? It's, yeah, it's less, it's less in my experience about the ratio and more about observing how the teams are behaving. And, and really where you see the, um, the benefits of automation come in having that, you know, whatever, whatever the team is that's, that you have, even one, two people, uh, whether they're spending their time doing high value tasks, uh, you know, and investigating things that can't be automated, that's where we see, um, you know, people really feeling that they've had success with it. It is definitely possible to implement a successful response strategy um, you know, with a team of one to two um, individuals, you know, supporting a company that has, you know, hundreds or low thousands. Uh, it's like Antonio says, it really depends on the environment and how they're able to uh, deal with the kinds of attacks that they have and, and how much they're able to leverage those repeated automations. Excellent. All right. Well, I appreciate everyone's response there to the poll question. Let me go ahead and share the results of that now. And it looks like it's a really, relatively even, you know, roughly even distribution across the three options there, the three different tasks. Um, Matt, what do you think about the results? Yeah, this is actually, um, this is more or less what I've seen out in the field as well. Um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of organizations either um, are looking to block at the edge, sort of the blocking IP address, or they're um, looking to automate that because they spend a lot of fiddly time dealing with firewalls, and that's often one of the lowest hanging pieces of fruit. Primarily because there are so many attacks that come in. I mean, if you're running any kind of public web service, application server, even if you're running, you know, any kind of back office back office access. Um, that involves people getting in, which you know during the times we live in is is so common. Uh, being able to shut down those attackers who are coming in while they're making the kind of passing by doorknob rattling attacks is very important, and that's a very common ask um, coming in. Um, in terms of the other two that bubble up to the top, disabling user credentials. Um, is often a high value response. And that's one that we see often in that sort of middle category um, where it's human guided, uh, oftentimes understanding what a, what a person's uh, reputation is can be a, a huge um, uh, advantage to moving that um, out of the automation into full automation. So you might be able to look inside of an email service and um, understand how frequently a user failed their uh, security audits, you know, the phishing, uh, hey, is this an email phishing? And then the users who are at the bottom of that list get automatically blocked if something bad's happening. The users who have responded really well, who are not on that exclusion list, might, uh, might have to have a human involved in the middle. Uh, and then, you know, hosts, uh, another really common item, and this really tends to go between either uh, endpoint devices, moving more towards the EDR space, or um, servers, or, you know, kind of more static resources. And the key to those kind of automations tends to be, how do you determine which ones are critical to you, and whether that pushes you towards more automation? You know, do I want to shut down the crown jewels when they're under attack? Or do I want to make sure that a human is looking at that? And, and it's very difficult to predict where any organization is going to be on that. You know, I see um, internet service companies who, who want to definitely shut down their back office systems immediately in terms of compromise. And I see, you know, companies that are very focused on a large workforce who that's the last thing they want to do in an automated fashion. Very nice. Yeah. Thank you for your feedback on that. Um, we got a lot more questions coming in here, so let's move on to a few of these. Uh, next one comes from Ted, who's asking, uh, when planning for strategic responses, 
Will determining a manual or human guided automation be based on response volume and response time? Volume is a volume is definitely a, a key a key player for that because that's your you know, your numerator, like how much time you can save. Um, you know, we often see people um, estimate, or when we look at the tools that these replace, you know, a playbook can easily save uh, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes of time. And of course, if you're doing that all day, that quickly eats into, you know, a single resource's time. Uh, the other big variable, of course, is the criticality um, that we talked about previously. Okay, excellent. Um, this is a good one from Steve who wants to know, how quickly can alert, alert logic realistically be implemented? So I'll, I'll so, take that uh, one, Matt. I don't have this. Oh, oh, Antonio, you want to take that? Thanks. Yeah, I was just going to say this is something that we hear about a lot. But, you know, a lot of the, the, the deployment time has to do with kind of the scoping and whatnot that happens once the purchase order has been signed, right? So we've got a project manager that reaches out to the points of contact. It has some information about their IT estate. So part of it is waking, is making sure that we get back that kind of questionnaire about their environment so that we know kind of what we're dealing with. Um, then there's a kickoff call that happens with the, with the manager, with the CSM, with our SOC manager and with the customers. So when you have multiple people, you're trying to map schedules together like that. And then you kind of have a go live date. Much of it is based on availability, but I've seen implementations that go as as, uh, as fast as two weeks. Um, and that's from, hey, you know, it's live and we're getting telemetry data and we're getting information to it. The reality is, is we also go through a, a, a timeline where we're doing some baselining um, some additional tuning. We're working closely with the customer to ensuring that traffic is legitimate, the incidents are legitimate, uh, reducing the false positives, which is something that we're constantly doing. So, you know, as fast as two weeks, but realistically, when the handoff happens, it's like, okay, now we have a pretty good indication of what's happening with this customer's environment. It's probably closer to about maybe four to eight weeks kind of but a lot of that is predicated on availability of schedules and trying to map everybody because there's a lot of people uh that, yeah. that need to be involved in the deployment process so matt you can correct me if i'm wrong yeah i was going to say one one other key thing that drives i mean and it actually drives both the deployment of, of our product and, and many products as well as the automation has to do with the balance of where your systems are um, and you know the folks we have who we're working with them for a lot longer and that information implementation team is really you know helping them through many steps tend to be the folks um, who have a presence in you know a, a physical data center somewhere where we're sending out equipment and racking and stacking and so forth the people who are on the shorter end of that timeline tend to be in the public cloud providers where you know it's uh, when we sit down on a call for automation for example in an hour, we're usually getting our first blocking solution up if it's in AWS, for example. Okay, excellent. And then here's another question. Uh, Gilbert's asking uh, kind of a two-part question here. How do you manage the tension and cost between false positives, uh, the lost data, and false negatives, the potential intrusions? And can this be automated or does it require human intervention in some cases? I can give kind of a mechanical answer to this, you know, which you know, which is that we will we will try to provide you with some um, some guidance going in about types of attacks that are you know good targets for automation, uh, and that's one of the things that we think that you know our expertise brings to the table because you know we develop a lot of our own content, um, you know, it's constantly tuned on our side. And so we can give you some some guidance about the kinds of things that you'd want to use for responses. Beyond that, uh, a lot of it tends to be the, the learning process, and that's why it's important to have this journey um, and you know learn to be able to look back retrospectively and see okay which things did I did I block and so forth, and then make those decisions yourself to bring certain portions of that forward into the automation side, the farther to the right in the diagram that that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, and in many cases, that, that goes back to kind of starting off with something simple. So simple action, simple responses, and ensuring that the outcomes that you get from those aren't 
a undesirable, right? And then adding some additional conditions and then kind of testing that and then adding some additional conditions and testing that. So the multiple forks in the road, which is kind of where the, you know, the concept of playbook. So if you're familiar with SOAR technology, essentially what you saw here is embedded SOAR. It's it's the platform with embedded um, uh, SOAR functionality that's, that, that's built in it. Um, and, and we can help you. I mean, we've got a threat intelligence team. We've got a uh, SOC analyst. We've got, you know, we talked a little bit about the the lack of expertise that exists in the industry. Well, we've got over over 100 people in of, of all varying types of, of security disciplines that are here. And that's kind of what we uh, what we help do. And if you're working with a partner or you prefer to go through a partner that's maybe doing some of that, we've more than happy to work with that partner as well to be able to get you the rest of the way. But in many cases, it's typically something that for most people, they're going to need a little bit of help at some point along the way, kind of helping make that decision. Got it. Okay. And then there's a question out here they're asking, basically, what's the licensing model with Alert Logic? How does that work? Do you want to take that one, Matt, or should Can I? Can I take it, Antonio? All right. Yeah, I was gonna say like yeah, like it's 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 um, a lot of this is based on um, the kind of protection that you get with us. Um, so in our MDR platform, um, there's sort of a very common, you know, kind of the most common level of this is our professional service, and it includes you know a whole bundle of different technologies, you know, based on detecting attacks through logs and network traffic automation, cloud integration with. Uh, third-party providers, and primarily that's licensed on a per-protected node basis, which is more or less like a, a host. There also at the kind of higher end, there are some more services that are layered on top of that, including you know a very uh, you know dedicated slice of a security analyst with us, um, and then those those are kind of add-ons on top of it. But of course, you know even the the kind of the middle of the road product definitely includes access to all of those people, but you know. If you want someone who's named and sitting down with you, that's that's sort of the highest enterprise level. Other things, Antonio, you want to call out on this? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. We've tried to simplify it. It's basically uh, two two options. It's either professional, which is everything that that Matt just said, which is essentially for the for the critical assets within the organization, the critical nodes within your environment, and then we have kind of another version which is called essentials. That's kind of your client systems. It's it includes asset discovery, vulnerability and configuration scanning. We have an endpoint that's included with that as well. And then if you want, basically a SOC person, an analyst, the guy who's, you have uh, the access to their phone number and they sit in on your team meetings and your staff calls and go over your security posture, we have that as an option um, as well. But we, we've really tried to simplify it and make it as simple as as, as possible. Uh, the, other, the only other thing that we have aside from that is for customers that are interested in having a, a managed WAF because we offer something like that as well. And that's something that we're more than happy to follow up with uh, whoever asked that question if they want to get some additional additional details. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we are starting to run out of time here. There's a lot of great questions in the queue. I'm afraid we're not going to have, have time to get to all of them live. But um, final question I wanted to ask before we wrap, wrap up here is just what should folks do to get started with, uh, with Alert Logic? Matt, is that something you want to chat about? Um, I think, Antonio, do you want to take the beginning of this? And if there's any technical questions, we can roll off the end of it. I think you're probably yeah. the, the big picture here. Sure. So we, we, like I said, take a look at the report. It's a great report by 451 Research that'll offer you some additional insights. We covered a few of the points in there, but it's a, it's a pretty good read. It's a pretty quick read as well to be able to kind of better understand uh, the, the, the maturity curve and the maturity journey. Um, and then if you're not familiar with this, you know, we, we've got some links in there as well, which we'll provide uh, for you um, as well, just to talk a little bit more, uh, to learn a little bit more about kind of what we do, what MDR is, kind of how we do it as well. Of course, you, you saw sort of a sliver of the capability of the platform that Matt just showed today. There's a whole bunch more stuff we can do, and we're always happy to engage with you. Or if you're working through a partner, we can work with your partner and kind of show you how we're able to work with your partner to be able to show you all the things that, that, that we can do. But like anything else, it really all depends on what are the things that you're most interested in understanding and the use cases that you want to solve for, the outcomes that you want to be able to achieve, and how we're able to achieve uh, those outcomes. 
Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. I, I do want to call everyone's attention to the getting started slide there. You see on the screen, uh, those highlighted uh, underlying links are actually clickable. If you click on those, uh, for example, to request a demo of the Alert Logic MDR, uh, that'll take you to the request a demo page. And uh, the same thing for downloading the 451 research report. So make sure that you check out those resources. Also, of course, check out the download that's available there in the handouts tab on the practical requirements for responding to cyber threats with MDR. Um, Matt and Antonio, a really great presentation. Love the demo. Thank you so much for being on the webinar today. Terrific. Thanks, Thanks for, for having, having us. us. Appreciate it. Enjoyed it. And thank you to everyone out there in the audience for joining us on the webinar. Um, before you go, uh, don't forget about the resources that are clickable right there on the screen. I'll leave those up while I announce our uh, Amazon $300 gift card winner. This is going out to Maria Lopez from Texas. Congratulations. We will reach out to you to deliver that prize and also reach out to our best question prize winner after the event. Well, thank you to everyone who joined us on the webinar. I hope that you learned a lot about developing a methodical approach to automating incident response for the cloud. Uh, stay secure, stay safe, and have a great day. See you next time. Bye-bye.